It's a real pleasure to be here today to share some of my ideas and my insights about scalable regional climate networks. <clears throat> I'm going to break my presentation today into five segments. Uh, getting things done at the regional level. We'll cover some of the uh, dynamics and characteristics and shortcomings of the way regional government work today and has work, worked in the past. Uh, second, we'll look at how climate change complicates regional governance and the inadequacies of this brown civics. Then I'm going to go into a short uh, case study of the White House Conference on Cooperative Conservation, which took place about four, four and a half years ago, which has been instrumental in uh, how I've framed up my approach to this whole topic. I'm going to go over the framework that I've been working on for 18 months to develop. And lastly, I'd, I'd like to solicit some reactions and suggest uh, some local applications of what I've been working on. And I hope to leave some time at the end for, for questions. I only have three answers, so whatever questions you ask, I am going to give you one of those three answers. Uh, part of the climate change conversation is about predictability and urgency. And urgency is somewhat relative. But for Mel Fenwick, it's something that needs to be done now and right now. OK, now I'm no Dudley Do-Right. The part of the urgency thing is about boundaries. Because boundaries separate the nearby from the far away. And what's the adage that uh, out of sight, out of mind? Creating boundaries, uh, boundaries are ubiquitous. They're, they're, they're part of the civilization. People use them to distinguish one territory from another, whether it's a nation, a region, or a neighborhood. Boundaries and borders come in all sizes. And they, and they define, the way you define your own boundaries uh, are really your identity frames. They determine how you perceive and respond to problems. Someone who identifies uh, their home turf as their, as their neighborhood looks at things very differently than someone who thinks of their territory as the South Coast or the Tri-County. As a planning commissioner, I'm confronted by these identity frames at every meeting I go to. As a mediator, it's my job not only to understand them, but to also leverage them, challenge them, and build bridges across them. When I go to work, I work in the in-between. And that's why I find my work in environmental dispute resolution and public policy uh, dialogues so fascinating and at the same time so challenging and rewarding. Physical and psychological psychological boundaries in one's own sense of territory create some very interesting dynamics. When we're in good economic times, people tend to uh, move outside of their boundaries. They feel confident. Uh, they want to see growth and development uh, of, of all sorts, from a personal to an uh, intellectual to a uh, geographic sense of things. And they get outside their comfort zone with not too much problem. When we have an economic downturn, uh, a train wreck like we had a year ago last October, and things change. People really are not very willing to go out of their comfort zone uh, for a variety of reasons. Predictability, security, and familiarity. People tend not to like unfamiliar surroundings, much less uncertainty when they're not feeling secure. And then along comes global warming and climate change. And yes, the gloom and doomers. With that comes fear, complexity, uncertainty. And you're going to hear me mention these three words over and over to the point where you may be going, let's get on with it. But those are the drivers of how people think in terms of regionalism and boundaries. Cities and communities can be quite good at problem solving in their own backyard. Pothole repair, 
creek restorations, uh, height limits, all kinds of things. But um, that problem solving capability starts to break down as they, as they venture outside of their boundaries. Well, what, they, what they don't do well is when problems are created outside of their zone of influence. Let's take the uh, city of Burbank, for example. Now, the city of Burbank got into a dispute with the uh, Burbank Pasadena Glendale Airport Authority about expanding the airport. And this, uh, this editorial was actually based on specific caricatures of the individuals who were at the negotiating table uh, that I was helping to mediate. And this is how they behaved. No wonder they couldn't get to agreement. No wonder they couldn't get together. Because they were, com they were dealing with problems that were far away, but they were shared problems that affected their ability uh, to develop a, a common approach. Now, closer to home, let's think about, for the moment, what happens when the grapevine gets shut down, I-5 is closed with snow. We see a lot more truck traffic. We see a lot more congestion along 101, and it's nothing we did here in the South Coast. It's clearly beyond our control. What happens when we see a, a, a drought? Our water supplies dwindle, and we have to do more with less. Again, that's something that doesn't take place in Santa Barbara necessarily, and we, when you talk about other regions, like Los Angeles, Northern California, the entire Southwest, that problem starts to multiply. Organizational structures, like transportation planning agencies, are just not built to handle complex problems. They, much less weather or natural disasters or things like that. Uh, and the reason is basically that regional problem solving is difficult because elected officials, it requires elected officials to, to lead on behalf of a, of a broader constituency, a constituency that is substantially larger than the constituency who elected them. And so they get confused about who they report to. And this is where things break down. The result is what I call Brown Civics. And Brown Civics is the old-fashioned way of doing regional planning. It's jurisdiction and single sector driven. They deal with issues one at a time, maybe two at a time. They are typically reactive, contentious, and threat driven. They got to do something now because they're going to run out of funds, and if they don't get that grant in to the federal government, they're not going to have the money uh, to do what they need to do. Uh, public engagement is largely an afterthought. And it's uh, the turf of elected officials only. People come and talk to them, but it's largely the elected officials who make the decisions. And this structure favors hard issues over soft issues. Now, green civics is a little different paradigm uh, for a, a different way to look at collaboration and leadership. It's governance driven, and it's a bottom-up approach. Now, there's a gap in gov between gov governance and government. Government occurs when people with authority are asked to make decisions and take action. Governance is where citizens and groups work together to plan and take action about shared goals. There's a huge difference there, because it's not just uh, the elected officials. It's folks from NGOs. It's folks from universities. It's folks from uh, social organizations who can help make a difference when it comes to tackling tough problems. It's cross-sector driven. They deal with complex and interrelated issues. And it's driven by leadership. Equity is taken into consideration, not just efficiency. And because they're dealing with complex problems, they tend to uh, value adaptive management over uh, command and control. Now, our track record uh, for bridging this gap between governance and government is not that good. The South Coast has had four regional experiments. 
one dealing with beach erosion, another dealing with uh, developing inter county, intra county transit between Ventura and Santa Barbara County, and uh, two others dealing with uh, economic and uh, jobs housing issues. One on the community level, uh, one dealing with Ventura and Santa Barbara in jobs, mobility, and housing issues. And for the most part, only the single issue dialogues have yielded any sustainable results. The other two, the Interregional Partnership for Jobs, Housing, Balance, and to some degree, the South Coast Santa Barbara Economic Community Project have not been able to sustain the results, much less the support from the community. And that, to me, is a sad state of affairs. But other agencies, other communities, are actually practicing this green leadership piece, this green civics. San Diego's doing it. They have a very, very productive program that applies a whole cross-sector approach to dealing with climate change. Uh, UCLA is starting to do it and, and, and implementing the same kind of approach to this very same issue. And Silicon Valley has had this regional governance approach for literally decades. That's how they were uh, born and developed as a regional economic engine, as they looked across sectors, they looked across their borders. So now let's take a little bit of a different approach and, and look to the bigger picture. Let's look to the issue of providing water to Southern California. I, I got into this issue when I was uh, co-facilitating the Lower Colorado River Multi-Species Conservation Plan. As, as Laura had mentioned, I was one of three people who was chosen to help uh, build an agreement about uh, balancing water, power, and endangered species protection. It took eight years to get the job done, but we got it done. And um, part of that process, I, I was able to uh, strike up a friendship with Jeff Keitlinger, who is now, he, he was general manager, he was general counsel then, he's now general manager to the Southern Cali Municipal, or the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And I went to visit Jeff late last year to talk about my approach and um, discuss what might happen in terms of a national conversation about climate resiliency. Uh, before I go much further, I want to give you a backdrop to what it was like in September, October last year. Uncertainty and risk surrounding climate change, change is a very scary thing to many people. The EPA has found that climate projections are so uncertain as to be unusable to the water and wastewater utilities throughout the United States as they contemplate how to make decisions on investments in infrastructure and system improvements, investments that total $480 billion. That's billion with a B. They don't have the knowledge and the context to figure out how to do it right. This is what I call, or what has been called, the stationarity problem. I don't know whether everybody is familiar with stationarity, but it's basically the concept that you can predict the future based upon the past. And last year, Scientific American published an article that noted that stationarity is dead. Because climate change trumps it big time. The yield of the Colorado River uh, has been uh, decreasing over the past 10 years because of a drought. And current projections, the best we know, is that by the year 2050, the inflows to the Colorado River system are going to decrease by a factor of between 5 and 20 percent. Now, this is a river system that is already oversubscribed. When the, when the Colorado River, uh, law of the river was developed in the 20s and 30s, they figured the system could yield about 17 and a half million acre feet. Well, it really came in to closer to 15 million. 
and that's distributed amongst the upper region gets half of that, the lower, re the lower region gets half of that. The Native Americans get as much as they want, and we get to send, we're required to send a million and a half acre feet to Mexico every year, year in and year out. That's the way the system works. Now, the, the MSCP that we negotiated was based on a historical baseline. So the agreement we came to is based on the past and not on the future. So think about what it's like for general manager Jeff Titan and I to come to work every day. I come into his office escorted by an armed guard. I'm greeted and asked to sit down nice comfy couch next to a coffee table. And on that coffee table are a series of periodicals. And I start looking through the periodicals. Quagga mussel, zebra mussel starting to infect, and I mean infect, the water systems of Southern California and beyond. Heat effects in Arizona, in the Southwest. The Delta, a train wreck that's already happening. And the inability to, to construct solar arrays in the desert and get that energy to market uh, through transmission lines which are endangering uh, some rare and endangered plants and animals. So we got a pretty big mess here. And that's what Jeff Keitlinger deals with every day when he comes to work. He's one of the largest regional uh, leaders in this country. And he has to deal with what I call wicked problems. Now, wicked problems are problems that entail a high level of complexity. They're interactive and iterative in terms of the approaches that are necessary. There's high levels of uncertainty, and they demand timely public attention and action. That's a pretty steep driveway for a job description. But that's what we've got to work with. And the silos of regulation that are represented by the state government and the federal government at this point in time don't help out. They really don't lend themselves to the way we have to deal with these wicked problems. So let's, for a minute, think about um, changing mindsets. Because global warming, climate change, it's a game changer. We know that. We know there's still some debate and some doubters that think that it's not really a problem. But those of us in the dispute resolution world have to deal with building agreements between parties who view science and certainty and uncertainty in very different ways of thinking. Uh, recent studies have, have shown us that there are three ways of framing the way we deal with problems. The first is a concrete mindset wherein folks look at things in terms of right and wrong, and uh, they come to those agreements fairly quickly. The second mindset, and we all, we, we've all experienced folks who are of the concrete mindset. Um, they know what they want, they know why they want it, and, and they're pretty close-minded about that because they, they're, they're confronted by uncertainty and complexity, and it's difficult for many of us to deal with that. Now, the affiliative mindset is a group of people who have a larger capacity to work with abstract ideas and tend to prefer consensus over contention. But they also tend to prefer implementing a mandate from somebody else that they trust. Follow the leader. Okay? Then there's the third mindset, which is a self-authoring mindset. And these types of people orient towards their own internally generated authority and welcome ambiguity, difference, and conflict as a way to understand data and context. So when you bring people together to talk about climate change, you have to weigh all these three different mindsets. And if you're lucky, you can get people in the room to do collaborative problem solving that are of the second or the third mindset. But we're having problems generating consensus if we're just talking with the folks from the concrete mindset. Now, that brings me to the 
title of my talk today. Many institutions seek to bring together folks to do this collaborative problem solving and initiative making, but they do, in do, doing so, they miss fleeting opportunities to change the game. And they do it in un, unsustainable ways. There is a tendency to forget that there is a lag between what we see happening now and what will happen next. And this lag is getting bigger and bigger, uh, as evidenced by the fact that we've already got a uh, one degree Fahrenheit temperature rise built into um, the atmosphere in the southwest. And we're going to see uh, increases in that over time. So big ideas and dealing with these problems and changing initiatives means having conversations with people you don't know, people who don't talk like you, and people who don't look like you. And that's where this uh, concept of cross-sector dialogues comes together. But now let's, for a moment, let's uh, take a little time out and go back to St. Louis four years ago. And what's remarkable about this event four years ago is that under the Bush administration, an executive order uh, was, was put out uh, mandating the strengthening of shared governance and citizen stewardship. And the Bush administration, with the work of EPA, Interior, NOAA, Department of Ag, Department of Defense, invited a 1,000 or so folks uh, from high-level positions throughout government, industry, agriculture, farmers, conservation organizations, tribes, you name it. It was quite a convention. And being driven by this executive order, it had some momentum, it had some pace, and it had some traction. What happened in this three-day conference is that the team pulled together a whole series of success stories about watershed agreements, about collaboration, about partnerships, about sustainable uh, approaches to land trusts and what have you and paraded out those success stories the first day. We took those success stories, and then in the second day, we focused on how to collaborate, how to do things differently. And with that collaborative learning, uh, we broke out into, facil into facilitated groups. So you can imagine the complexity of taking 1,000 people and breaking them into uh, you know, a whole bunch of groups of uh, 20 to 35 people. It was mayhem, but they had 35 of us seasoned facilitators and mediators together to focus people on very, very specific questions. And the questions that we worked in, in the two groups that I facilitated, had to do with accelerating cooperative cons uh, conservation as a way of doing business, about creating capacity, building skills, and practices across organizations. And what we heard from folks um, was, was quite remarkable. And I'll come back to that in a little minute. But the process worked well enough to generate a whole series of national and regional initiatives that came out of those three days of doing things differently, about having conversations that matter as opposed to speeches that don't. And I, I can, uh, if, if you go to conferences, Conferences are really not a sustainable way of doing things because you hear a bunch of people talk, you network for a while, you go to the luncheon, you go to the after, after party, and then you go back to doing business as usual. This conference was not that kind of conference. It was a very different paradigm. Then two years later, I'm uh, in Tucson sitting in another conference, this time with practitioners and users of uh, dispute resolution. Uh, methods, and I uh, sat down next to the Director of Conservation, Partnership, and Management Policy for the Secretary of Interior. It was kind of a uh, uh, special event. And we came, uh, we talked about the White House conference because uh, folks in her office and I worked together 
on that. And at this point, we realized, as Yogi Berra realized long ago, that the future ain't what it used to be. And we needed to do something different. And I suggested that we might apply that conservation uh, approach to climate change. And she looked at me and she said, oh, really? Tell me more. We went on our separate ways. And uh, what I'd heard at that conference and at St. Louis was that effective action at the, ha happens at the local and regional levels. The feds really should be there to help and stay out of the way, only if needed. And that reminds me of the uh, comment that was made by Kevin Conrad at the Bali um, Climate Convention. He was a delegate from Papua New Guinea. And he addressed the statements of uh, the stalemate that uh, had happened at that conference. And he, he basically said this said, in talking to the United States. He said, we seek your leadership. But if for some reason you are un not willing to lead, let, leave it to the rest of us. And please get out of the way. And that, to me, spoke volumes about the political problems we have in this country, particularly at the legislative level, about the bickering that goes on um, while we're dealing with some serious problems, a, uh, a long emergency, as, as some folks say. So at that point, uh, after those two conferences, an idea started to take shape in my mind. And uh, in response to trying to get something to Olivia, a proposal, when you get to meet with the director of partnerships in the office of the secretary, and she says she's interested. You do something, and you do something pretty quickly, and you have to get it right. So I started thinking, what if we change the dynamic and ask people to pool their resources, to have a different kind of conversation, a super regional conversation about hope, about strategy, and about collaborative action? And it's that hope that drives Jeff Keitlinger, as far as I'm concerned, to go to work every day and to deal with those wicked problems. What if we provided the structure and opportunity to make those conversations happen at the, national, at the regional level and at the national level? And regional climate action networks are that very approach. They ask people to pool their constituencies, their egos, their smarts, and their leadership to engage in collaborative learning and capacity building to respond to an uncertain future develop and implement meaningful initiatives, and do so with a strategy of little or no regrets over time. That's the piece that's the big challenge to the water utility providers who have to spend that $480 billion over the next 20 years. They have to do it with little or no regret. And that's, again, a steep driveway. These regional networks apply and refine the time-tested approaches that we used at the White House conference to give constituent communities better tools, more mental mass, and greater capacity to do things differently. Imagine a conference or a series of conference days that starts where most conferences leave off. People from different backgrounds uh, talking to each other and exploring uh, specific ways to do things differently. Now take that structure and those ideas in the context of the Southwest Conference and replicate it in the Midwest. If you did it in the Southwest, you'd probably talk about energy, talk about water supply, you'd talk about public health, you'd talk about environmental justice. Now take that conversation and move it to the Midwest and talk about flooding. Move it to the Northeast and talk about water quality. Move it to the coastal communities and talk about sea level rise. And all of a sudden, you're starting to get traction on common themes and uh, relevant approaches to doing things differently in the face of these wicked problems. And what would happen if we connected those various conferences, either electronically, physically, or in time, we brought together different sectors to talk about how they view problem solving and share their ideas. 
what we came up with is an approach to convening these very types of dialogue. We started with a national level conversation uh, motivated by an executive order, pulled together case studies, success stories about what works and why, what are the themes, challenges, and barriers to making a difference, and then bring that to a federal framing committee to do the conference planning to actually put on a conference about climate change resiliency and adaptation and capacity building, structured much the same way we did the White House conference, and then take those outcomes and feed them down to a next level of regional dialogue to talk about issue-specific, location-specific issues, cross-governmental working groups, and government-to-government -government alliance building. All of those things need attention, and they need it now. We took this, this was, this took us about seven versions to get it, what we thought to get it right. We talked with a whole number of people. We talked with the Department of Interior, the EPA, water utility districts around the West. We talked with local thinkers. We talked with uh, NGO representatives from the uh, Friends of the Earth, from the Climate Justice Research Project, from engineers, from nonprofits. Then we took our idea, we took it back to the Resolve Board of Directors. And Resolve was the uh, parent organization of the, uh, my colleague who I developed this process with, and Juliana Burkhoff and I uh, put a, a lot of time into thinking about this, and she has a very, very uh, powerful board of directors. And we chose to do it under Resolve's uh, moniker because they have nonprofit status, and we knew we needed a receptacle uh, to deal with these fundraising issues. And the amount of iterations that we went through try to figure out, to try to untangle this hairball uh, of how to make this work. Took some, uh, some real thinking, and we got hammered. We got hammered by the board of directors who said, great idea, but it's too big. Getting an executive order is not realistic. Taking a national level approach is too complex, and you need to chunk it down. So what, that's what we did. We collected all the pieces that were strewn across the floor, and we started to rework them. We threw some of them out. We kept some of them. We put some new things in the mix, and we came up with a regional approach, one that is much more manageable and works that is scalable up to the feds and down to the communities. So what we do in this process is we talk to people who have good ideas so we can get smarter as conveners. We identify and structure and leverage cross-sector working groups that can get the horsepower to get people on board and in the room to start talking about what to do about this climate change wake-up call. Staying ahead of the curve and managing in uncertain times. We can talk about water, water quality, coastal erosion, flood hazards, infrastructure, you name it. We've got plenty to work with. Out of those discussions uh, come initiatives that we could then take uh, and feed back up to the feds and down to the local. Now let's make it a little bit more relevant to where we sit today, our neighborhood, and the Santa Barbara South Coast or the region. Let's talk about some organizing questions. How do we cut through the silos of state and federal government and the bureaucracy that they create to build renewable energy facilities and get the power to the people who need it and not have to take 10 years to do it? So it, it takes between eight and nine years to get the permits uh, to, to uh, relocate or revise any of the major elements of a transportation system, particularly 
uh, bridge crossings, creeks, what have you, when you're dealing with transportation corridor siting. How might we take advantage of the National Climate Service? Should it be implemented by NOAA at the federal level? In the climate legislation that's currently in front of Congress, there's an effort to try to leverage a National Climate Service uh, to function much as the National Weather Service does, but to do so in a much broader and more usable way. How do we prepare vulnerability assessments? Do we use the federal way to do it, or do we craft our own approach and our own uh, using of, of science at the local level? Because things here in Santa Barbara or Ventura or San Luis Obispo are not really the same as things are in Atlanta or in Arlington, Virginia. Think for a minute of a tale of two cities, Santa Barbara and Goleta. You look, this is, a, this is a pair of slides taken from the Pacific Institute report on, on sea level rise. What it shows is under worst case conditions, we're going to see about a 55 inch rise in sea level. And that rise coupled with a storm surge is going to inundate major parts of the airport and major parts of Santa Barbara's waterfront and portions of its lower east side. Now, it so happens that beyond the issue of flooding the airport, the wastewater treatment plant for all of Goleta is located in this inundation area. The wastewater treatment plant for Santa Barbara is located in that inundation area. That seems to me to be a call to action to start thinking about things differently thinking about them in a regional scale. Because if we start to see these uh, utilities and infrastructures threatened, we're in some serious doo-doo. We really are. Now, now, let's go for a moment to the Biona wetlands. I've been working in the Biona wetlands for four or five years now, trying to craft a, a restoration plan. Now, the plan we're developing, that our, I'm not developing it. Uh, technical scientists are, and the Coastal Conservancy and the Fish and Game are. But it requires uh, whatever plan to come about to be responsive to sea level rise. And part of that has to do with relocating utilities. There are gas lines, water lines, and electrical facilities, particularly a high pressure oil filled, uh, high voltage line that goes through the wetland. Well, to relocate just one of those gas pipelines costs between three and five million dollars a mile. That's, that's not pocket change. To relocate the, the high pressure energy transmission line is between five and ten million dollars a mile. We don't have that kind of We've got to figure out how to deal with that wicked problem. And my suspicions are, if you look at um, where the airport ends and where the Goleta Beach begins, there's been some research that talks about a whole series of uh, gas lines, uh, electrical lines, sewage treatment lines, and other critical infrastructure that's located in that area that's going to be, have to be dealt with as we move in to more parts of the 21st century. Now, I mention this because we're not alone. The climate ad adaptation strategy of the, of the state's uh, recently produced, uh, reproduced report shows a whole series of different interrelationships between the marine environment, the energy environment, forestry, water management, air quality, public health, and ecosystems. So this is not just something you snap your fingers and get people uh, to talk about. We need to engage the best and the brightest to create the mental mass to start to think long term. Now some people are starting to do this. The uh, International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, referred to as ICLE, out of back east, they've been doing some very groundbreaking work around the country and internationally on helping local 
communities to deal with some of these challenges. They collaborated with the University of Washington and King County in Seattle to develop a framework and a how-to guide for building climate resilience. So we're already starting. There are other areas around the country that are doing these things, but there's no clearinghouse that has all these tools together to help people ramp up to get going talking about solutions. So where does that leave us today? The Bren School is in a very unique and critical position to take leadership in, the, in this area. And I think it could be something that you might refer to as a uh, center for regional leadership and resilience. We've got the right people here. We've got the right people in the community, in the county, in the region uh, to seize a very unique opportunity and combine those resources, those constituencies, those smarts, and the leadership to set the stage for starting a climate action network here and now. I understand that Bob Wilkinson is working uh, to try to bring Nancy Sutley, the head of the Council on Environmental Quality, to, to Santa Barbara in April. What if we had uh, a concept we could hand to her as she walked in the door that said, we're on top of it. We think this matters, and we want your help. How would that change the game? If not now, when? If not us, who? Somebody's got to have a comment. Yes, sir. Well, we, we thought about how to use technology, <clears throat> and the place we started was the so social networking uh, that goes into everything from Twitter to Facebook to a whole uh, set of ways to engage people to get them talking about it. I think the, the uh, uh, software and technology industry has to be in the conversation to help us figure out uh, how to work. If you listen to public radio uh, over the last two weeks, uh, you know that uh, a group had been formed and, uh, uh, of people in technology that were talking about emergency response. They had a plan that was waiting for an opportunity to happen. And when Haiti happened, they brought it to bear. And they have they made some progress in dealing with that. It's those type of approaches that we need to start thinking about now wait, rather than waiting too late. And I'm not a, a technology guy. Uh, but I know uh, there, there are some remarkably bright people out there. So there's a start. They've, they've already weighed in, Intel already weighed into uh, what's called the uh, U.S. Climate Action Partnership, which is a Fortune 100 group of folks who couple their resources with NGOs and uh, folks from all walks of industry, from ConocoPhillips to, to Johnson & Johnson, uh, to start to work on uh, what would be the consensus elements of a cap-and-trade policy. And they worked for two and a half years uh, where CEOs actually brought their resources to the table and they brought their staffs into these conversations to develop an approach that formed part of the basis of the uh, Waxman-Markley uh, climate change plan. So they are engaged. We just have to give them a reason and a direction to help us not only look at the mitigation side of the equation, but the adaptation side of the equation. Because the adaptation piece is harder to grasp. It's not right in front of us. It's not nearby. It's far away. But it's not always going to be far away. So there's resources, there's structures for making that happen. 
is just getting the conversation going. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions. It's a uh, question has to do with the White House Conference on Cooperative Conservation. You talked about a paradigm shift in the way that conference was handled, and I assume from what you said the shift was having the breakout sessions and the various groups. So my two-part question is, what did those groups deliver back to the, the 1,000 people who attended, and how did anything become implemented based on this paradigm shift? You bet. Um, what we did is, in day two, we broke into uh, 36 groups in the morning and 36 groups in the afternoon. And each of those groups had a, had a facilitator, a note taker, and a prompter. We had very specific and consistent structure between all 36 groups in the morning and all 36 groups in the afternoon. Note takers knew what to look for and how to record it. We took those uh, and we really probed people. This was happening the day Katrina came on shore. And there were people in the audience in tears because they were losing uh, uh, wetlands in Louisiana. And that was their life, was protecting wetlands. But we worked through that. At the end of the day, uh, all 36 of us sat down. We collated all of the ideas we had. We provided two-page summaries of, of each session we had we, from each group. We collated that into a larger group, cherry-picked ideas and, and phrases and comments that were made throughout each of the sessions turned that around at, at overnight, got it to the printer at midnight, and when the 1,100 folks came into the uh, convention center the next morning, they were handed a 36-page report that listed outcomes, themes, values, and quotable quotes. We took that, and while we were doing that, we put together a PowerPoint presentation and two panels one of federal uh, managers, one of uh, intersector, cross-sector, uh, movers and shakers. And we talked about what would make a difference and how to make it happen. From that, um, we, we extracted a series of initiatives that the Department of Interior and Lynn Scarlett was, was really instrumental in making this happen. The Department of Interior took, took the results and ran with it and every year since then, they have been giving uh, community awards and regional awards to notable uh, success stories that have come out of that conference. So we institutionalized a process of taking ideas, translating them into initiatives, and then taking those initiatives and giving them life action at the local level. And that is pretty powerful. That's the paradigm shift I'm talking about. We saw it happen. And I know it can happen again with this particular power. Well, we, was that, did that answer both of those questions? You bet. Yes, sir. Very interesting. Uh, going back and through some of my notes here, I have in Brown Civics, you talked about elected officials only. And in Green Civics, you talked about a f informed uh, public judgment, the fact that you basically have civic responsibility passed down to the masses. One of the things I'm noticing in, in the public discourse right now is a very venomous kind of teabagger uh, approach to the American um, populace, kind of this populism, this new populism, that people are very angry at their elected officials. And it seems like for this paradigm shift, what you're asking for is a informed civic um, group to allow this kind of consensus to be built. It seems like right now we're fracturing more than ever. What would your advice be to elected officials who are basically trying to combat this knowing that they need to be getting together to talk about things when localism is the only seem thing that seems to be really fighting for right now? Well, the, the problem with uh, what you described and the problem with a lot of community and regional uh, issues is that the community doesn't own the problem. The elected officials don't own the problem. And if you can't own the problem, you can't begin to start to be uh, unconditionally constructive. And the 
and being unconditionally constructive, looking, working hard, working deliberately to find solutions, even though they're not apparent, they're not obvious, and they're not intuitive, is an absolutely essential piece to making progress on a very daunting front. And I am, I am not optimistic about the current uh, political setting in the United States today. I mean, I was just talking with a, a friend of mine last night, and he said, Professor Dovson, he's role-playing me to try to get me you know, ready for these tough questions I was going to get today. And he, and he, and he said, you know, he asked me, what, what are your senses of optimism? And, you know, there's not very many sources of optimism right now. But what it takes is a, a connecting people. It means talking about values, about fears, about hopes, and without making judgments, exploring the what if and the whys and the why not. And once you start to do that, and you do it on an interpersonal level, things happen. I'm a mediator. My, uh, my currency is relationships. So that's what I like to do, even though I have to deal with an angry public. That's what I choose, because it makes a difference. Question number three. I told you I only had three answers. Uh, you suggested that for April this year that communities should have something ready to put on the table. Could you uh, expand a little bit, suggest, uh, based on your, your St. Louis experience and so forth, uh, some concrete uh, actions to, to have something ready for April? You know, Whatever I would say would be wrong because it's uh, the voice of one person. And it's only when you start to get people in the room to deal with a deadline and to deal with a the problem they own that they're going to make any progress. So being a process junkie that I am, I, I want to get the right people in the right room to have the conversation, and I'm not going to prejudge my ideas on what they think might be the problem. It's a challenge for neutrals such as myself uh, to leave our baggage and our, and our intellect at the door and come in as uh, Columbo. But that's what we do a lot of times when we get together with people to deal with differences as problems to be solved. No, battles to be won. Somebody has to start the fire. I think we could do it. I think we could get a, a small group together through the university, through a couple of uh, community leaders, and talk about what we wanted. What's the, if, if climate change is a problem, how can we gather and, and maintain the attention of the South Coast and the broader region in general about uh, responding to the problem uh, because until folks are out of their comfort zone, they're not going to see that there's a problem. And that's a real challenge. But I think if anybody is capable of doing it, it's a small coalition uh, that's, that's made up of the kinds of minds and perspectives that are in this room, in this institution, and in this community. Uh, so it's, it's a thought that I, uh, I pulled together this morning as I was thinking how I was going to close this talk and not just leave it on the national or regional level to make it real for people here in Santa Barbara. So good question. I don't have the uh, pet answer. Uh, it was not one of my three pre-prepared answers. <laughs> Maybe it should have been. Thank you.